one thing of the presentation you don't am. So I'm talking about uh, video games and specifically art direction and things I wished I knew before becoming an art director. And before I'm going into detail with that, I'm going to talk about where I'm coming from so you can put everything into perspective. So I started out as an indie dev. I did, um, I co-founded a small studio with a couple of friends of mine. We did indie games, like we were super proud because we got dev kits and like we got a Steam release and it was like super awesome and everything was cool. We peaked at about 10 people, which was very f scary at that time because 10 people sounded for an indie dev like way too much. And from there, I, like about three and a half years later, I decided to move on to the next project, the next thing. So I left Freaks, they're still out and running, which makes me very proud. And I got hired by a company called Good Games. And Good Games at that time was looking into um, making a AAA game. They were looking into figuring a way out to do a brand new IP, stamp out a studio out of like nowhere. So when I joined, it was about 10 people. And over the course of that project, um, I became art director. Um, I hired a lot of people. I helped building the studio to a 120 people team with 30 artists. And I also mentored other leads and hired other art directors for other projects, helping out the studio in general. So the majority of my experiences I'm going to talk about come from here. A year ago, I left Good Games. Um, I was lucky enough to get my dream job. Like half a year ago, they hired me. And now I'm back to doing actual 3D art. So my current position is in a AAA studio, but I'm not leading there. So they were really, really kind enough to, make, to allow me to do this talk, but I'm not going to mention where I'm working right now. So um, thank you, anonymous developer who's allowed me to do this. <laughs> what? <clears throat> so, oh yeah, back. Oh. Let's start with this one. So, as I mentioned, I started as a lead. And at that time, the team was super small. So we had like three artists, and it was in total like 10 people. And my art director, and my art director, my head of studio at that time at some point went like, you're going to be the art director. And as every sane person, I reacted like a sane person said like, hell no. Like, I'm not going to direct that. That's like way out of my league. And so we agreed on, I'm going to prepare. So I started preparing. And as every sane person, I went to like these boot camps several times, which was very helpful. And over time, I kind of felt ready-ish. And you, you kind of look into art. You, you study like all the blogs and all the stuff that comes up, right? And you're trying to figure out all of these things, but you never feel quite comfortable with it. And the nature of that is because there is so much to learn. You can't know everything. It's close to impossible to know all the things you want to know about video games. It's just not possible. And then what happens is basically because I talk to so many directors and, and, and artists and leads, it's always the same thing. You never will feel ready. You always feel like an imposter. Like you're, you're waiting for the moment where people go, Rogic? Oh, I thought you're Rogers. Get out of here. And it never goes away. Actually, it gets worse. Because the more I started figuring out what I need to know, the more I realized I'll never be able to figure everything out I need to know. And so over time, that got worse. And um, the thing with imposter syndrome is, you feel completely out of place. You feel like you don't belong where, where you, and unable to what you're supposed to do. So this is pretty much how I felt. And I panicked constantly. I got anxious. I was nervous. I wasn't very fond of the whole situation because um, the whole thing just got worse over time. Because when you start out with a small team, you can still go like, OK, well, it's just a couple of people. I can handle that. But the team grows because that's what you got hired to. So over time, the team went like to about 50 people. And team meetings became a monster, because you're standing in front of 50 people. They're waiting you and expecting you to know what you're doing, but you have no clue what's going on. <laughs> and so your art team, like I remember the first time my art team hit like 15 people, we do like the first team meeting. And I'm scared as hell, because they expect me to know what's going on. And I'm like, hi. <laughs> and that's pretty much the monster that's chasing you. So like your imposter syndrome gets worse because there's this thing that you're running away from because you don't want to make them know that you're an imposter. And then things get worse because you, now that you move into direction, you get information that is exclusive to you. So you know schedules, you know all the problems, you know like politics way more that are usually being kept away from you. You get to know like all the details that make the problem seem even more impossible. And so that small foundation that you work so hard on that you feel like, oh, I'm the artist, I can handle this, it's crumbling because like all that stuff that you have is not way, no way that's going to work out, like ever, because it just makes everything crumble at that point. So I got nervous. I, I was super nervous. I couldn't talk to people. I, I got anxious. I'm, I'm a weird personality in general, but oh boy, I can get weird. Like it, it gets way worse. 
So when I'm nervous and I'm anxious, I get fully weird. And that was the point where I kind of realized for myself, I need to change something because I, I can't be that nervous, insecure person in front of my team. It will just won't work. So my solution for the whole thing is this word. I'm not saying you should do that, but like pantalones means pants in Spanish, and that's it. It has no other meaning. But when when we were doing board game nights, at some point I caught it up. Like I went through iteration like a proper game developer. I thought that one's good. And I turned into the Pantalonis Pokemon. That means I greeted people with Pantalonis. I said goodbye as, with the word Pantalonis. I signed emails with Pantalonis. I critiqued art Pantalonis. Every time I was nervous, I used that word. And I turned into a Pokemon. It turned into a running gag. Like people just, like it was a thing. And the weird thing about it is it actually worked because I calmed down. And the moment I remember where I realized it was I come in in the morning, there's a designer and a coder, not even related to my team. They're like half dead because in the morning, nobody's awake in the morning. They're like slurping a coffee and they don't even think and just say pantalones. As you know, okay, I got it. Like if I can get a group of people randomly saying a completely random word to me in the morning without thinking, I'm actually directing. Like this is, this is in essence, this is direction. So it, it worked out in that sense. And the funny thing about it is as well, like it calmed me down, which was essential because I, I wasn't anxious anymore because I realized I'm here for the fun. I'm here to enjoy myself. I'm here to enjoy all of this with like all the people that are in my team. And it, it helped me to kind of accept the fact that it doesn't matter. Like it's just, it's just there for the shits and the giggles, right? And so I got happy. I calmed down. I was like, yeah, this is it. Like this is what I want to do. This is, this is where I'm going right now. And it was really interesting because um, as I calmed down, my team calmed down. So um, I realized something that my personal motivation actually is also the team's motivation. So it was like my first big lesson I had was I'm here to motivate people. And again, like when you're expecting to be art director, you go like, oh, I'm going to do art direction. I'm going to show everybody what kind of art we're going to do. But actually what my first big thing was is I'm here to motivate people. I just have to get people excited about the stuff we're working on. And I mean, it makes sense in a, in a way. Imagine you're going into a meeting, the art director's sitting there and he's anxious and nervous and like <laughs> and the lead goes like, holy shit, what's going on? He's nervous. And so he gets nervous because obviously if he knows probably things I don't know, where in my head it's like, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And he goes down to the artists and He's nervous because he thinks I know something he doesn't know. And therefore, he's nervous. And the artist goes like, oh my god, my lead is nervous. Something's going on. And the lead goes like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And the artist gets nervous. So like, it, it kind of mitigates down to the team. It's, it's fascinating because you don't think you have that power over people, but you do. And so what happens is when you relax, the opposite happens. People calm down. Like, oh, my art director's chill. Everything's fine. OK, we'll be good. If your art director is actually super excited at what you did today, you'll get excited because you're an artist. You want to get people excited. That's the nature of your job. So in a way, you being happy and motivated actually pushes the entire team. And I'm mentioning this because it's so important to find a way to do it in a positive way. Because some people have imposter syndrome or something similar. It's, for every person, it's different. But if you use something that's negative to kind of cover it, it will hit down to your team, and it will create an atmosphere that is not positive and not productive. So it's very important, whatever your pantalones is, it has to be something that, that enforces positivity, because it will hit your team really, really hard. And so that's how I felt. I had still my imposter syndrome. I felt totally out of place, but I was happy. And everyone else behind me was happy, too, because, well, we're dealing with the shit together. So I thought I figured it out. I know how to do the art direction. I need to be happy. And I don't care that I don't know anything. And so what happened next was, OK, so art directors are supposed to know things, right? Like they have, they're supposed to have an overview over things. So you take a step back, and you take an overview. And that's your job, right? Like you're enjoying that because it's kind of cool. You get all the information. You know what's design doing. You know what's code doing. Like you're talking to the head of studio. And every now and then you meet the CEO. And like that's kind of fun. And you, you see way further than anyone else in your team, and that's your job. And then, especially when you used to be an artist, a problem pops up. And you go like, well, problem, that's my thing. I'm an artist. I'm solving problems. That's what I did the last 10 years. So there we go. I'm solving the problem. And while you're solving that problem, the dude who's supposed to keep the overview is not there. 
and things get worse. And you go back, and there we go, imposter syndrome. I have no idea what I'm doing. And this is so simple, but it's so straightforward. It's, it's micromanagement and delegation. Like, I, I guarantee everybody of you have like, cursed their lead or their director or like, whoever is superior that like, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's not in control of that, and why is he micromanaging me? But it's so difficult in nature, because when, when you move into leadership, the thing you've been doing till then is the exact opposite. So it's in your human nature to act like this. And like making sure you're not doing this is something that has to run constantly in the back of your mind. And it's sneaky because you never realize you're actually doing it. Because it, it is something that is nature to you. So you, you have to kind of get rid of it. And at the same time, you can't get rid of something that you have nurtured for decades. So the thing that you realize at that point is I have leads, I have artists. Those guys are the people who will take care of that, like who, who won't, like it's their job now, like you're the guy who has the overview and your leads will make sure that whatever is going on there will be handled. And the beauty of it, and that's a big realization for me was your leads don't, like you're, you're hiring to your weaknesses. You're getting the people who are way better at stuff you have no clue about. So one person sitting back there, um, she got precisely hired for the fact that I'm chaotic and I'm nervous and she's calm and very organized. And um, my boss was smart enough to do that. And once I realized that, a whole world opened up because I realized, well, I have no clue about animation. Maybe we should hire someone who's really good at that. And we did that. And he took care of the pipeline. And we met every now and then. And he told me, this is what we're doing. And I'm like, yeah, that works with what we're having in plan. Keep going. And that's amazing because then you have like a group of people who are totally specialized in what they're doing. They're way better at what you do. And guess what? The imposter syndrome just slightly gets away because you figured out, like, I don't have to know all that crazy stuff I have no clue about. And so over time, you're calming down and you realize giving ownership to people is a big deal because it makes people motivated. It's, it's that one thing that people make them stay longer, which I'm German. We are all about efficiency and time efficiency and all that kind of stuff. So it, it sounds nice, but it's kind of evil where you go, like, you own this. This is yours but you have to take care of this, right? And because you own it and you take pride in that, you take care of it. You stay longer. You might come in a weekend or two. I don't know about it. I don't care. It's good. So it's a nasty thing, but at the same time, it's a great thing because people actually enjoy doing it. And it, it doesn't matter at that point because you, you're having fun. Like, you're, you're, you're owning that. And so with that in mind, you're realizing, okay, I have to give people ownership over the stuff they're working on but I still need to direct them because I have the overview. I, I need to figure out how to make them build the things I need without taking and stifling their creativity, right? So you're standing there and you start, start to figure out, like, how can I do that? How can I give them very clear direction? Because this is what it boils down to. And I've seen it go south both ways, where one way is where people hone in and give like very, very detailed feedback. And then the other one is where they get like very abstract feedback. And we called it the fazoozle. And there's tons of versions where you go like, OK, this doesn't have enough punch. There isn't enough jazz in it. Or like, there are terms you can't believe. Like, it's, it's crazy. And the thing is, it's really bad, because people don't know what you're asking them. Like, they don't understand what you want to go for. But you're not doing it on purpose, because you just want to make sure that they can do what they want. So it's, it's almost like an art form to figure out, how can I get someone to do what we need without taking away all the creativity and like ownership out of them. And in my experience, the best metaphor I have for that is this, where you go like, it's somewhere in this location, which could be the briefing you have from creative. It's somehow something like that. In that case, like we need a ship to get here, but figure it out yourself. And um, I just talked to an art director a couple of weeks ago, and he said something really smart to me. It's like, directors give direction, never solutions. And I think that's the nature of it. So, and that comes with it. What makes it hard again is whatever you had in mind won't be the thing they're going to build. The, the thing they're going to build will be something else. It will fit the criteria, but it won't be what you, what you imagine it's supposed to be. But the beauty of that is the only person who knows that is you. When, when the player is going to play the game, the consumers see it, and it fits. It fits. Like, the only person who has to be cool with it is yourself. But obviously, because you used to be an artist, and you had like a very small thing in mind, and you always had 100% control, it's very, very, very hard to let go of that. Because it, it is not in your nature. And so having this team, having this group working on stuff that you 
have no control on and at the same time trying making that navigate, you will suffer with that. Like you, will, you will try so many things and it won't work out in the beginning and it's totally fine because you're learning that. Like this, is, this is actual art direction. Like this part to me was the most, like that, that's the nature of making art direction because you're directing people to a point without telling them what to do. And the only way to learn that is try and error. Like there is no magic bullet for that. And you will suffer, I promise. <laughs> so with that in mind, you realize you need to know your team. You need to know the group you're working with. Because that sort of feedback is very, very personal. So one person would need a specific set of words on sentences that triggers them to do that. Some people would very badly react to that. So you have to figure out who reacts to what, what way. So you start getting to know your team. And that's something which is super difficult because, as I mentioned, you're the guy who has the overview. Like you're the person who actually deliberately tries to stay back to keep everything working. And it's very easy because you spend a lot of time in meetings. Jesus Christ. A lot of time in meetings. And you'll have like these small intermingling five minutes in between meetings where you meet people. And if you don't maintain the relationship to the artists you work with, and when you're a director, the, the leads you work with, and you don't understand them on a personal level, it will make things worse. And so it is super important that you understand your team dynamics, you understand how your team is built up, how it works, how they kind of communicate with each other. And so when that happens, you look into that moment where, how do you say, um, you, you, you understand the person, you pinpoint them. Oh, I messed up my presentation, sorry. Um, imposter syndrome, there we go. Um, so you work with that, you, you work with people, you figure that out, and you have that team almost like running a ship, and it's autonomous, and you need to know. And so what happens, and that's the part where I should have been, this one, you start introducing other people into your team, and this can be in very different ways. And I, sometimes you inherit people, sometimes you put people in your team that you don't know. And it's always a risk, because that happens on every team I've known so far. Like, it, it is in the nature of the thing where you if, if you, even if you know your team dynamic, figuring out the right people, getting to know the right people, and putting them in the right spot is insanely difficult. And this will happen, I guarantee, at least in one of your teams. But the important thing is you know that's there, and then you know that it's, it's, it's a thing that can happen. And the, the way I would encourage you is try to counteract it by making sure that the the person you're introducing is definitely a team fit, what you feel like. What we did is we had like an interview where I just made sure, okay, he fits, it's kind of okay. But then on top, we had um, people coming in and I made them go out with the team. And I was like really, really weird dude who was just around the corner like looking what they're doing. Like, is it working? Do they talk? Is there something going on? And sometimes you could see like nothing's happening and you go like, oh, I don't think that fits. But sometimes the team opened up and started talking. We just hired one dude who literally just made the team talk. That was like his major attribute. And we're like, they're talking. Why are they talking? They never talk. I think we should hire this guy. So you'll figure this out. And the interesting thing is another thing you can run into is you'll, you'll hire people that you like, which you should. But at the same time, what happens is sometimes you hire people who like the same soccer team or like the same drinks you do, and like it becomes too, too much narrowed down to one specific thing. So what you want to do is, and that's why this happens, is you want to have diversity. You want to make sure that like the group of people you're hiring is as far spread as possible. And, um, I had like one really weird example that someone on our last team told me on his previous project where they had no female concept artist or no female in an entire character pipeline. What happened was during the production, they were like done with like a big set of characters. Someone further down the line went like, they look like prostitutes. And I was like, oh shit, you're right. And you have like this entire pipeline. You spend so much time and money to do this and you just realize, oh crap. So the di more diverse your team is, and the more different kind of mentalities you have your team, the more you can counteract these things. And obviously, we're creating games to be pleasurable as to many people as possible. And the more AAA you get, the worse this gets, actually. So handling that diversity with that kind of mentality that you want them to work together, but you need them not to be the same, leads to this anyways. Like, it always will lead to these problems. So you'll have it. Know your team so you can fix it really fast, because it can cost time and money big time. 
And coming to my last point, this one is kind of summarizing all of it. Um, I, I truly believe that all of the points before boil down to please leave your ego at home. And this is easier said than done because we're all human beings and you feel pimp if you're leading a lot of people. Because the bigger the team gods, the more responsibility you have, the further you float, the more detached you are, the prouder you get, right? Like, oh, look what I'm leading there. <laughs> and you're, you're like proud about this. You're, you're, you're engaged about it, but you're vain about it as well. And some people, as I mentioned, ha have the imposter syndrome and they cover it by just adding more people into the pool and doing weird things with that. And so what happens at that point, it, it's the negative effect I mentioned before where it, it, it backfires heavily. So the thing is, when, when you have your ego, and that's, that's the worst part about my presentation, all of the rules I just stated and things I mentioned, you have to break them constantly without you wanting to break them. But sometimes there's a situation that comes up and you realize, oh shit, I need to micromanage this because it doesn't work. You don't want to, but sometimes, for example, you have a team that you give them ownership, but they just can't handle it at that point because they're not ready for it. So you have to go down and just help them to get into this. If you do this for the wrong reasons because you want control, you're ruining that team. If you do it for the right reason because you see they're struggling and you're helping them out with that and making sure that they get like a smooth run into that ownership, you win, so you're breaking that rule. If this is coming from the wrong place, it's dangerous and it happens easy because, again, it's sneaky. It's like something you're constantly running in your mind making sure I'm doing it for the right reasons. And I've seen teams falling apart because someone in a higher position was afraid to ask for help, which, again, is a vanity and ego thing. Like, it never hurt anyone ever, no matter what position, to ask for help. Like, I constantly Miranda to my head of studio and asked for help, and it never backfired. When I screwed up, the first person to know was my boss. Like, dude, I screwed up. This happened. I think I'm going to fix it like this. If you're screwing up every day and you, you're afraid to go to your boss, you should reconsider if you're ready for this, because then again, it's your ego that prohibits you to realize you're jeopardizing the entire team, which means you're jeopardizing a lot of people, because you're responsible for that. If you screw up, the project might get canceled, so you're not just ruining your career, you're ruining a lot of careers. So it's really hard and really tough to make sure and maintain that mental state. And um, apparently I wanted to stretch, but I was nervous, so I was really fast. And there we are. I'm done. <laughs>